two texts from our ancient scriptures. Put on the wardrobe of God, dress in compassion and kindness, uh, humility and quiet strength, and put on the all-purpose garment of love. And a gentle answer turns away wrath. A harsh one does not invite a conversation. It invites a fight. Ancient wisdom that challenges an instinct that we all carry to punish people when they do bad, to cancel them, that's a relatively new term, but it's a really old process, to cancel people when they misbehave, to shame them, to judge them, to make them pay. It turns out <clears throat> that the most effective st st strategy for making change is not a harsh answer, is not canceling. Then, uh, two TED Talks last week, two women deeply engaged in social justice, grappling with the limited efficacy of canceling people, the limited efficacy of calling people out. Champions of social change reiterating some ancient spiritual truths. The best way to bring about change, dress in the compassion, in the, in the in compassion and kindness and humility, quiet strengths and the all-purpose garment of love. We also saw that in order to participate in canceling, we have to uh, buy into two very dubious propositions. The first, that we are 100% right and they are 100% wrong, that we have the whole picture and they do not, that we see the full context and they do not, and second, that they will never change. Uh, don't bother having constructive engagement because they are going to keep doing what they've been doing and they're going to keep doing it forever. And both of, theirs, we, both of those we saw are very dubious propositions because if we apply them to ourselves, we realize, yeah, I'm not like that. But somehow we make the decision that others are like that. So it was a sound lesson. It was. <laughs> both ancient and contemporary wisdom delivered by a fine speaker... <laughs> And if you missed, you're going to want to listen to the audio podcast or you're going to want to watch the video on our website. And then after that, that I mentioned, fine lesson, one of my favorite things happened. You all begin to push back. <laughs> That's great. Hooey, Doug. Well, not hooey exactly, but more. A little out of touch, Doug. I think, Doug, you might be trivializing how painful it is how difficult it is to make space for the other. Because we're in the, uh, here's the here now small doable stuff, here's the practical part of the lesson, and now all of a sudden we start imagining ourselves doing it. The first part of the le lesson was conceptual. Conceptual, okay, fine, get that, but now we're actually gonna actually do these things. We're gonna do small talk in order to create social cohesion. We're gonna return wrath with a soft answer. We're going to lead with compassion. You're not wrong, Doug. Those things are great big truths, yes, but you might be just a little bit out of touch because I don't think you're factoring in how hard it is to do the here now small doable stuff. That's the challenge. So today, I'd like to talk about that, <clears throat> and mostly I'd like to talk about it by telling you a story. Um, it, this could have been one of two stories, because <laughs> there are a couple of areas in my life where I'm kind of screwing it up these days, uh, but I'm just going to tell you one, and uh, you know, maybe some other day for another lesson, I'll use the other one. But uh, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you one of those stories today. When we finish, uh, we're going to talk about the lesson together. Uh, we're going to deepen our uh, experience of these principles by having conversation with one another. And at the same time, because we're doing it together, we will be restitching the torn fabric of community. And by the way, somebody mentioned this week that I should mention. When we do these things at the end, these groups at the end of the um, lesson, you are welcome to duck out. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there is a, a greeting opportunity to make it kind of convenient for you to duck out. We kind of hope that you won't do that because we think what we're doing is pushing up against a cultural norm of both culture and religion that needs pushing up against. We hope you will stay and engage. Uh, but <clears throat> if you really don't want to, you don't have to. That said, if you do decide to stay, one of the rules is you get to say, I'd like to just observe today. I'd like to just watch how this happens and not have to feel the pressure of participating. All that's uh, fair game. So today, during the lesson, you're going to hear my story. 
And I am betting I'm not alone. And so tell about one of your afflictive emotion experiences, one of your afflictive emotion moments, and did you find the thing under the thing? Or now in hindsight, looking back at it, can you now find the thing under the thing, maybe the thing under that? And second, those two dubious propositions, they are 100% wrong, I am 100% right, and they will never change. Did those things get you the way they got me? So you could be thinking about those two things. We'll have the discussion after the lesson. So <clears throat> had a promising conversation this week about a possible new home for us. Uh, there's one more approval hoop that needs to be jumped through. If that happens, I will let you know as soon as we know. That said, it's been almost a year and a half that we have been looking for a new space. Every single week calling, every single week emailing, every single week following up, sometimes stopping by because we can't get a return phone call, telling people and telling people and telling people about us, usually to an audience that's slightly suspicious, albeit polite, not very curious. So when we started our search, I encouraged our Find a New Home team to focus on churches because churches, we all know, are in decline. That means that they're, because there are a gazillion of them, there's a lot of underutilized space going on in Wake County right now. And many churches are in need of income. So it just makes sense that we wouldn't go out and build out some kind of flex space. We wouldn't go out and try and raise a capital campaign. That we would try and integrate ourselves with other congregations because it would cost us less money and it would benefit other congregations. But as this search has drug on and on and on, and as every Sunday I've been coming in early and seeing the lobby jammed with all of our worldly possessions and knowing that our kids team is limited by what they can do because of the space constraints that we now have and week after week getting off the phone yet again having received another very polite cold shoulder and knowing in my mind they need our income but still you might mess up the kitchen, so we better not. Or, you know, the kids might be noisy, so we better not. Or you're scary because you like gay folks. Or you're scary because you might treat us badly, so yeah, we better not. And sure enough, I've started having some afflictive emotions. <laughs> Now, you will hear that term around the community from time to time, afflictive emotions, usually in the sentence, afflictive emotions are our friends, because afflictive emotions tell us that something is going on inside. An ego self has been poked. A shadow strategy has been poked. Some story that we live by isn't working very well. And afflictive emotions are our friends because they tell us that some unseen, unconscious, psychological or emotional driver is there and it's been agitated. So, here I am having them. And given how many times I have stood in this very space and said, afflictive emotions are our friends, you might think I would make the connection. <laughs> and I did not. Mostly, I just let those emotions run under the surface, mostly in the background, subtly luring me into those two dubious propositions. Stupid church people, 100% wrong, or 100% right. Stupid church people never change. Now, here's what I was mostly not doing, paying attention. Here's what I was mostly not doing, noticing not observing my own internal narrative. And because I had not been noticing, observing my own internal narrative, more and more frequently my internal narrative started popping out, <laughs> not staying internal. And I found myself saying out loud, what is wrong with these people? Turn down money that they need just so they can say no to us? What is wrong with these people? Now, throw in a bad word, and now you've got a picture of my internal dialogue. That's what's going on in my mind. 
how has our religion made us less open-hearted? How has our religion made us less gracious? How has our religion made us more suspicious and more insular? So when folks say, Doug, this part of the section, this section of the lesson, this practical, here now, small, doable part of making space for the other, Doug, maybe it's a little out of touch because it doesn't factor in. Well, I get that. I mean, I can feel that. I know what folks are saying when they object. So I bet you have had some version of what I've just described in my own experience. I bet you, too, have had some space or some person or some group that when you encounter them, you also get a little ginned up, maybe angry, maybe disgusted, maybe resentful, maybe inflamed, maybe like me, a little bit hold a grudge-ish. Maybe, like me, it hasn't been doing a very good job staying under the surface. <laughs> Maybe it's been coming out. So I'd like to talk about that today. <clears throat> so here's the thing about afflictive emotions. When you hear the word emotion, it means feelings. And you have probably heard me say a hundred times, the thing about feelings is that we feel them. They surge up and they don't ask for permission first. <laughs> when they come up, they come up unbidden, and they color our vision. In fact, what our feelings are trying to do is dictate something that we will do next. Because that's the evolutionary purpose of feelings. An external stimulus, somebody or something happens, and unbidden, our bodies pump out a bunch of chemicals and we feel them, that's what feelings are. And those feelings are intended by natural selection to evoke a response. Maybe that response will be a survive danger response, maybe that response would be a bond and breed response, a think this thing response, or a say this thing response, or a do this thing response. So when out-of-touch preacher man stands up and says, don't think or say or do that thing that your body is designed to think or say or do, yeah, he's not wrong. There, he, he definitely referenced some ancient wisdom. He did bring out those two TED Talks and a fine delivery indeed. <laughs> but are you kidding? <laughs> are you out of your mind? So... <clears throat> I hope you saw the title of today's lesson because I hope you opened the Thursday email. Uh, and it said this, get angry, exclamation point. Do, really, get angry. And then in parentheses it says, but don't stop there. Get angry, but don't stop there. Get angry because you have a body and that body has chemicals, and those chemicals do pump in whenever we get stimulated, and for goodness sake, there's plenty of stimulation going on these days. And when that happens, what we call those surging chemicals and what they feel like inside of us, we call that experience often anger, or resentment, or disdain, or some other afflictive emotions. So, the title of the lesson, do that. Feel that feeling. Describe it, especially notice it, because we don't really have the option to not do that. Because again, stimulus, response, chemicals, and feelings. So get angry, but don't stop there. Also, in addition to getting angry, notice. Notice that you're angry. Notice resentment has come up. Notice that bitterness has come up. Notice that judgment has come up. Notice. Because when we don't notice, those afflictive emotions remain in charge. When we don't notice, preacher man says some little ditty like, a harsh answer turns away wrath, or lead with compassion, or small talk and social cohesion, or somebody has to break the cycle, how about us? And when we don't notice, which I had not been noticing for some time, those strategies that really are here now small doable, they're all very doable strategies, you might as well be asking us to fly. Because you can't do those. Even though they're here now small doable, you can't do them when... So, get angry, but don't stop there. 
Step one in the don't stop there is notice. But for step two, let me tell you more of the story. Still not good. <laughs> I determined when I was in seminary that I was not going to be a hypocrite preacher <clears throat> because I had seen a whole bunch of hypocrite preachers and I swore to myself I'd never do that. I worked really hard to keep that commitment. Consequently, the first audience for my lessons are me. That has been the case for 30 some years. If I say this stuff, I can't not do this stuff. So here is how that has gone for me. It's not pretty. This would be so much a better story if I had seen myself slipping sideways. If I had noticed that I was falling into resentment, that if I had noticed that I was falling into bitterness, if I had been aware that I was perilously close to hatred, it would have been so much better if in this story I had been consistently faithful to my meditative practice so that I was able to observe my thoughts when they were being hijacked by my chemicals. It would have been so much a better story if I hadn't calcified around, they are 100% wrong and I'm 100% right, if I had not calcified around, they will never change. It would have been a much better story if I had been able to see myself letting my false self <clears throat> get the upper hand. Such a better story if I had seen this happening and I had simply returned. Returned to the inner light, returned to the divine that I carry within. That would have been a good story. That would have been a good minister right there. That would have been a good minister. But that's not what happened. But that's okay because fortunately there's a backup plan. And in my experience, I've got a very particular kind of backup plan, and it is the remedial student way of approaching this, and the remedial student way of returning to the inner divine, and it's more of a slap in the head approach than it is an intentional approach. But I've seen this pattern in my life, and it's the pattern of repetition. I will see a thing, and then I will see or hear it again. And then, often again, a third time, at which point, then I say, oh, oh yeah. Well, that happened three times in as many days. The first time, I watched Angie uh, in a situation, and I watched her lead with compassion. And it was very effective what she did, and it was, had a great outcome what she did. And what made me notice it most was how different what she did was from the internal dialogue that I had going in my head. Mine was more of a rip him a new one internal dialogue, <laughs> but she actually evoked conversation, and she actually evoked change. And my internal dialogue in that instance, thank God it stayed internal, was what the TED talk called last week, not an invitation to change, but an invitation to a fight. <laughs> Had I done what was in my head, it would have just been an invitation to a fight. So I saw Angie do this thing. And I saw my head all geared up to do a very different thing. And sure enough, I noticed. The next day, I saw Julie do the exact same thing in a very different context. And then the next day, it happened again in a third context. And at this point, oh, okay, inner divine, you have my attention, all ears here. So I started to turn my attention inward. And when I did, the first nudge that surfaced was, I cannot skip meditation. I really can't. Even when I have all these interesting things going on that are calling for my attention and I want to jump right up and I want to get right to the computer, I just can't skip meditation because it makes me dumb. Club day's coming up. I'm glad club day's coming up because I have to find a group to meditate with. Because when I don't meditate with people, so many times I am very likely to blow past, it doesn't matter how many reminders I put in place, I will blow past them. But when I do it with people, then I know I do it. And when I do skip, I miss so much. I get sidetracked so frequently. First inner nudge, you cannot skip this meditation thing. 
Second in, uh, internal reminder was, hey, knucklehead, it's time to do some self-examination. Uh, it's time to look at your shadow side. It's time to look at the thing under the thing and potentially the thing under that. It's time to look at what are the afflictive emotions telling you. So I did that. By the way, <clears throat> to help me, I looked at the, took a look at the uh, questions again. Christy just did a great update of the questions. They're up on the website right now. If you go to the About page and then you go down to Self-Awareness and Enneagram, you can just look at the new worksheet. We don't call it a worksheet anymore. We call it The Questions. Well, even before I had finished working my way through the questions, I saw something clearly. Aha, I know this territory. I've been here before. I have reverted to my personality type. I am a very polite person, but rip a new one is kind of default setting for me. <laughs> if I am not attentive to the interior voice, that is where I tend to go. I will see some true thing. Admittedly, it's partially true, but I default to those two dubious propositions. My partial truth, 100% true. They never change. Now, when I tell myself that story, then I get to take on the role of defender of justice. I get to take on the role of defender of what is right and good and holy, which is such a nice story. I love telling myself that story. But in essence, I'm all geared up and I am ready to lambast, but of course, in the cause of justice. <laughs> now, I do have a truth. It is harder right now to find an open-hearted church than it was seven years ago when we did this last time. Churches are more brittle right now, less hospitable. Christian folks are more strident these days, harsher these days. So it's an easy truth to run with, my partial truth, and it's easy to tell myself a finger-wagging story. But <clears throat> you know we study the Enneagram. The seminar is coming up soon. Uh, Robin's going to speak next week. The Enneagram helps us know the pitfalls into which our personalities are most likely to fall, those things to which we are most likely to be vulnerable. And my personality abhors, above all things, feeling vulnerable, abhors above all things feeling weak. Now, I never saw myself doing this in my earlier life, but I spent most of my early life arranging and rearranging my world so I would never feel vulnerable, so I would never feel weak. Now, what that meant was keeping people at a distance, never depending on anybody. Now, I was very dependable because I wanted to be a good person, but I made sure that I was never in a position where I was depending on other people because there's a really good chance they're not going to follow through. They might be dependable, but they really might not. And so I just didn't for a long, long time. Now, I probably learned 500 things going to school, maybe 1,000 things going to school, but here's one that stuck. It came from a graduate class in counseling. Probably because I've had to apply it to my life so often, it's stuck. Here's how the cycle of life goes. It's a four-stroke process. It starts with attachment. Attachments are where we live life. We attach to people and places and things. We live in our attachments. But as long as we live in the impermanent world that we do, every attachment will bring about a separation. And we will always be separated from everything, if nothing else, less just by our death. Attachment, separation. Every separation comes with a sense of loss, and every loss must be grieved. And if we grieve healthily, we then open the door for making new attachments. So the process goes, attachment, separation, loss, grief, attachment, separation, loss, grief, attachment. It's how human life goes. We make our attachments Every attachment eventually separates. We feel the loss of every separation, and every loss must be grieved. But here's the thing. Grieving is a next-door neighbor to vulnerable. And so consequently, yeah, I don't like that. Uh, so I'm not alone in the not liking part. One of the more common things that we human beings do 
is subvert that process somewhere along the way. We will often deny an attachment or deny a separation from an attachment. We will often uh, deny that there's a sense of loss and we will move on before we feel the loss. We will usually subvert grief and turn it into something else because grief is painful. One of the primary things that we subvert grief into is anger. And so here I am self-examining and I am realizing how quickly I have grown angry at church people. But I know this thing, had to apply it a bunch of times in my life, so it doesn't take long for me to realize, oh, I have subverted my grief. I am angry, but I'm also kind of sad, really sad. Now, that's a perennial blind spot for me because I don't like to do hurt. I don't like to do sorrow. I don't like to do those things because I've spent a whole lot of my life arranging my internal world so that I don't feel those things because those things are adjacent to vulnerability and I am staying away from vulnerability. So here I am self-examining and this cycle of life comes up and I realize loss. I have lost something. I've lost my people. I've lost the people who taught me selflessness. I've lost the people who taught me an open heart and an open hand. I've lost the people who taught me grace and tolerance, who taught me that we invite people in, who taught me the way of Jesus that does not impose a litmus test first before it embraces and invites and welcomes. They taught me, we don't ask, do you believe the right stuff before we accept? We don't ask, do you reject the right people before we invite in? We just invite people. They taught me that. They taught it to me when I was a teenager. I went to their seminary so that I could learn how to teach what they taught me. And now I've lost my people. And given my predilection to avoid vulnerability, I submerged that loss. I ignored my grief, and when my surging chemicals started surging, I turned my sorrow into anger and disgust and rejection. I will reject you. I defaulted to my rip a new one narrative because that feels so normal in my brain. Excommunicate me, will you? Reject us because we don't match your priorities? Slam the door in our faces, will you? Well, hold my beer while I eviscerate your faulty position. I, I could do that. <laughs> but here's the thing. Keep playing that narrative in my head. The nice thing is I don't have to feel my loss. I don't have to grieve. I don't have to feel vulnerable. But it's not long before those dubious propositions get a whole lot easier to swallow. Keep playing that narrative in my head and not looking at my blind spots, it gets a whole lot easier to find a partial truth and make that the whole truth. I have a truth, I do. What they're doing is wrong burning the damn planet down, standing on the side of inequity, shutting people out. There's a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of stuff that really is wrong. But maybe my 100% perception that they are and we are and all never going to change, maybe I'm wrong too. But you can't see that when you're stuck in a narrative that's there to defend a faulty ego self. Maybe, though, if I do, maybe if we do the interior work, by the way, did I mention club days coming up, or we get together to help one another work the circle, engage in the ancient practices, maybe if we do the here now small doable stuff that would repair the breach, Maybe if we do the interior work that would allow us to do the here and now small doable stuff, maybe we wouldn't feel like those things are so out of touch. Maybe we wouldn't feel like those things are so inaccessible. So when Club Day comes and folks stand up right here, they will invite you to some group and some event. There's a lot of fun in there because it turns out that the communal is fun and the contemplative, the learning and the serving, these are fun things to do. They're great ways to connect with people, but
but they're designed to help us help each other dismantle your version of false self. I just talked about a little bit about how my version is being dismantled again. But this is how we awaken to the inner light version of self. This is how we awaken to the divine center self. So you'll be invited by people standing right here to practice the communal and the contemplative and the learning and the serving practices, which in old religious language are ways that we turn our hearts toward God. Spiritual practices that over time will transform us, make us the kind of people who are capable of, able to, do a gentle answer that turns away wrath, able to lead with compassion, able to get out of our silos and engage in the small talk that will restitch the torn social solidarity, and be the kind of people who decide it is to us to break the cycle. We can do that if we engage in the interior work necessary to do that. So in Dwelling Divine, may we be people on a journey of inner transformation so that we can be people on a journey to world transformation. Amen. Well, <clears throat> we all give online now, so if you would, please prepare your offerings. If you go to our website on your phone, the donate button is at the top. You click on that, it'll show you lots of options. There's lots of ways to give. It's about as easy as can be. And so if you live here in Raleigh or if you're uh, logging in from far away, we invite you to take an ownership stake in the community. Remembering, as we say all the time, that there is good return when we invest in spiritual community because we give our time and our energy and our love and we give our dollars. Then the community takes those resources, amplifies them, and gives them back to us in the form of a context, an environment in which we thrive and flourish and grow. So again, we all give on our website. It's about as easy as it can be. Uh, go there. So in a minute, we're going to dismiss those of you on the live stream. And here in the room, we're going to do what are you thinking. So we invite you to do it as well, but you, uh, you will do it on Zoom. The link is on the front page of our website. And if you've hung in here this long, we're just going to tell you the password. The password is, get ready, 1417. Once again, 1417. Don't be a troll or we'll boot you out. But it's a great way to connect, a great way to think more deeply about the le lesson, but also to build your network of communities. So we hope you'll join in. And why don't we then prepare to dismiss them. If you would, please put your hand on your heart. And let's remember as we go that we are, every one of us, carriers of the indwelling divine. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, these are in us because we carry the very breath of the divine within us. And if you would, extend your other hand to our city. Let's look for opportunities to share what's in us with the people that we live and work and go to school with looking for opportunities to repair and heal our worlds. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed. We are not dismissed.